Hello everyone, welcome back to the class of macroeconomics. In today's lecture, we are going to finish the discussion related to measuring the economy and then we will move on to talk about consumptions and savings. So the topic that we are going to address for today's lecture are as follows. We are going to talk about how to express numbers of goods in economics based on the value of the goods. The second topic that we are going to address is what are the differences of different deflators for which we use to express the number of goods in economics based on the value of the goods. Then we will talk about what are the decisions made by consumers across time. And then we will talk about how to add up income occurred at different time. So then the outline for today's lecture is as follows. We are going to talk about the concept of prices. And then we will talk about the price indices, which includes GDP deflator and CPI. Then we will talk about the issues of CPI and then talk about the comparisons between CPI and the GDP deflator. And then we will move on to talk about the topics related to chapter four, that is about consumptions and savings. We will talk about interests. We are going to talk about consumer's behavior and we will talk about the concept of present value. So now let's begin with today's lecture. Before we go through a details for two price indices, I want to first define a couple terms. The first term I want to talk about is price level. The price level, the abbreviation for that is P, it is a measure of average money price. It is not about the price of milk or bread, but it is about the average money price for the entire economy. The price indices is only a formula that tell how to calculate the average money price to express the price level of an economy. Based on this price formula, the number we get from there will be able to tell us what is the price level. The third terminology we want to introduce here is called inflation. It is the percentage change in an economy's overall price level. Given that the price level is expressed by price indices, we need to use the price indices to help us come up with the inflation rate. Now let's look at an example for how to come up with the inflation rate. In here, we have an example for the price indices in three years, 2025, 2026, and 2027. The price index shows that the price level is 110 in 2025, 100 in 2026, and 108 in 2027. So now we want to figure out how to come up with the inflation rate. So to come up with the inflation rate of 2026, then we use the 100, that is the price level in 2026, minus the price level shown by price index in 2025, that is 110, divided by 110. And then we will get it to be minus 9%. So in here, because the price index usually shows the price level by the end of the year. So when we uh, compute the inflation rate for 2026, it means that uh, it is the price change from the beginning of the 2026 to the end of the 2026. Given that the, at the beginning of the 2026 is approximately similar to the end of the 2025. So we use the end of the year data for 2025, which is 110 as the price level at the beginning of the 2026. So then the inflation rate we got is the changes in the price from the beginning of the 2026 to the end of the 2026. To come up with the percentage change, the denominator need to put in the price level at the beginning of the 2026. In here, we adopt the end of the year price level for 2025 and then put it in a denominator and that is 110. So in this case, given that the result is minus 9%, we have a name for this phenomenon. We say it is a deflation. So now we can continue to do the computation to get the inflation rate for 2027. Given that the end of the year 
of the 2026, the price level shows is uh, 100. And at the end of the 2027, the price indices show the price level is 108. Therefore, we can compute the inflation rate that is 108 minus 100 divided by 100, and it equals 8%. In this case, we call it inflation. So to understand the degree of how the economy's price level change over time, we look at the inflation rate. And the inflation rate comes from the price indices. Therefore, later on, we will define two price indices. One is called GDP deflator and the other is called CPI. So before we talk about the GDP deflator and CPI in detail, we want to talk some more terminology that we need to know before we talk about the price indices. The terminologies that we want to look at is the nominal versus real. A nominal variable is defined as a value that does not adjust for inflation, and the real variable is a value that adjusts for inflation. And the relationship between the real and nominal variable is defined as follows. We say that the real variable equal the nominal variable divided by the price indices divided by 100. The reason why the price indices need to be divided by 100 is because a lot of time when we express the price indices, we multiply it by 100. That is because when we are showing the price level, we use the price indices. And the, when the price level are exactly the same, you may think that in terms of the ratio, it needs to be equal one. But when we are reporting the price indices in the government statistics, in that case, we will show it as 100. So you can think about that 100 as 100%. So then when we are computing the real variables, we use the nominal variables divided by the price indices. Given that this price indices is augmented by 100, so then now when we want to convert the nominal variables into the real variables using the price indices, we need to divide the price indices by 100. In other words, that when you are computing the real variables, you need to use the nominal variables divided by the price indices multiplied by 100. Now let's take a look about how to come up with the real variable. In here, we have the nominal income in 2029, 2030, and 2031. The income level is 100,000, 105,000, and 108,000. If we look at the nominal income, we may think that, well, our income, in fact, got increased over time. In 2030, it is 5,000 more than 2029, and in 2031, it is 3,000 more than 2030. So it seems that uh, we may be happy about the income change. However, we know when we obtain the income, we are going to go buy goods. When we go buy goods, then we need to pay and then buy the goods. Then the price matters. So it turned out that the price level in 2029 is 100. In the price level in 2030 is 108. And the price level doesn't change from 2030 to 2031, which remains as 108. So then how to come up with the real income? We know that the real variable equals the nominal variable divided by the price indices multiplied by 100. So then for the year 2029, we know it equals 100,000. So in here, you can tell that if the price level is exactly the same as the base year, that is the Whatever year is the base year, as long as your price level is 100, it means that it is the same as your reference point. So then the nominal income will be exactly the same as the real income. So now let's take a look at the real income for 2030. 
So even though the nominal income got increased by 5,000, but once we take into account the price changes, we are going to get the real income and that equals $97,222, which means that even though you got the salary increase from 100,000 to 105,000, when you go buy goods in year 2029, you can buy the goods that values $100,000, but in 2030, you can only buy the goods that values $97,222. So in here, if the nominal income increase is less than the price level increase, then the real income will fall. Then finally, we have the real income for uh, 2031. We, you may notice that in here, the nominal income is $108,000, but the price level is 108. So then it means that compared with 2029, the nominal income increased by 8% and the price also got inflated by 8%. So then it turned out that the real income is exactly the same as the real income and the nominal income in 2029. So from this example, we can have two conclusions. The first conclusion we get is that an increase in nominal income is not necessarily lead to an increase in the real income. For example, the year, the income from 2029 to the income for 2030. The second conclusion we got in here is that we now know it is meaningful to look at the real variables when we want to compare the data, for example, the GDP per capita across time. If we don't take into account the price changes, we may exaggerate the actual gain we have because what we care is about how much goods we want to we can buy instead of how much nominal dollars that we get. So then when looking at the data across time, we need to use the real variables instead of the nominal variables. So now let's look at another example. Under this example, we are not going to give it the price indices, but we still can come up with the real GDP and the nominal GDP. Under this example, we are given the price and quantities for woods and ore that is produced in three different years. If you may recall from what we already learned last time for how to come up with the real GDP and the nominal GDP, this is exactly what we had last time. We said that the GDP is the sum product of the price and quantities, therefore we have the nominal GDP. We just use the price and quantity of each year and then come up with the nominal GDP. But when we come up with the real GDP, we need to define the base year. And in this example, we define 2030 as the base year. And then we come up with the real GDP for the three years. As you can see in here, that if we focus on the year 2031, you will notice that when we compute the nominal GDP, we have the quantity for 2031 for wood that is 1000 and for ore that is 205. When we compute the real GDP for 2031, we also have the quantity for wood that is 1000 and for ore that is 205. And then the difference between the computation for nominal GDP and the real GDP boil down to the difference in the price. That is, when we compute the nominal GDP, the price in 2031 is 35 and 105 respectively. But when we are computing the real GDP, we have the price that is 30 and 100 for wood and ore respectively. So hey, wait a minute. When we want to come up with the price indices, we want to see how does the price level got changed over time. So then if we look at the nominal GDP versus the real GDP at the same year, then somehow we fix the quantity and then we allow the price to change. So then we should be able to derive the price indices from comparing the nominal GDP versus the real GDP. 
So let's recall what we learned before. We said that the GDP is the sum product of the price and quantities, such that the changes in the GDP can due to two factors. One is changes in the price and the other is changes in the quantities. So then if we look at the real GDP, we say that it is the sum product of the price and the quantity, but the price will be fixed at the base year. But then for the nominal GDP, we say that it is also the sum product of the price and quantity, but we allow the price and the quantity to change and that reflect the quantity and the price in the year that we are interested in. So then if we look at the real GDP, we say that, hey, we have the quantity that happened to the day t. When we look at the nominal GDP, we also have the quantity at the day t. So then when we compare these two variables, one is real, the other is nominal, we find out we fix the quantity and then we allow the price got change. And that is exactly what we want for a price indices. We want the price indices to reflect how does the price change over time? So we define something called GDP deflator. We say that the GDP deflator at day t equals the nominal GDP at day t divided by the real GDP at day t multiplied by 100. Because the real GDP has the quantity at day t and the nominal GDP has the quantity at day t, but the real GDP have the price at the base year and the nominal GDP has the price in day t. Therefore, the ratio of the nominal GDP to the real GDP reflect how does the price level got changed in the weighted average at day t versus the base year. So then this is a price indices. Let's go through the detail for this formula for those of you that still find this concept confusing. So if the base year equals the day t, so then the price we adopt for the product 1, product 2, and product 3 will be exactly the same for the real GDP and the nominal GDP. So then if we have the nominal GDP divided by the real GDP multiplied by 100, we are going to get 100. So that's because the nominal GDP equal the real GDP in the base year. What if we are not in the base year? Then we are going to get the price for different goods are different at day t versus the base year. So then the nominal GDP and the real GDP only differ in the price. So then we will be able to have the ratio of the nominal GDP divided by real GDP and one multiplied by 100 and it reflects the price level of the year T versus the base year. So that is why we call the GDP deflator is a price index. Now let's look at this formula in more detail. We said that the GDP deflator is the nominal GDP divided by real GDP multiplied by 100. So let's look at the ratio of the nominal GDP to the real GDP. It turned out to be that the, for the nominal GDP, it is the sum product of the price and the quantities. And for the real GDP, let's just write it down as the real GDP. And then it turned out that we can rearrange the equation. We are going to get the formula that the nominal GDP to real GDP ratio is the weighted average of the price and the weights are the relative importance of each good in the real GDP. Because of that, this weight somehow got changed over time because in each year, the quantity of each goods relative to the entire real GDP are different. So for this type of the price index, we call it the Posh Index. So up to this point, we've talked about the first price index, which is called GDP deflator. It is a price deflator derived from nominal GDP and real GDP. The key feature of this deflator is that it has the weights for the average price that changes over time. 